right. So it's my pleasure to introduce our invited speaker, Matt Might. Matt started his career in um, computer science, in static analysis and programming languages. He, he, uh, one of his work is abstracting abstract machines, which is a really fun and useful way to do static analysis uh, by deriving the static analysis from, um, from, uh, from, from an abstract machine. And there is, there is a, a, a PLD Redex tutorial on this one, his uh, collaborator platform. Matt also has a popular blog post where he exposes many ideas in computer science, sometimes using Scheme and sometimes also other languages. And uh, he's uh, slowly been shifting uh, to biology throughout the years. Um, he has been on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School as well as a strategist at the White House. And now he's moved uh, to the University of Alabama, Birmingham to be the Honorable Director of the Hugh Cole Personalized Medicine Institute. And I guess he will tell us about how to move from scheme to personal medicine. <laughs> That's right. Um, it's a long road. Uh, yeah, so actually a, a few disclaimers first. So I, I still technically work for the White House, uh, or at least 15% of me does, so it's like from this knee down. Um, so I have to give a, a warning, a word from the White House that is, that this is not an official talk um, by the administration, and it is in fact um, a personal talk. And it may not represent the views of the President or the administration. Uh, so please don't go back to saying this is what the White House is saying. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that it certainly used to represent the views of the President and the administration. Uh, and if you want to know the actual views of the President and the administration, this is, I kid you not, literally Twitter is now official policy. So just check Trump's Twitter feed. Uh, with that in mind, the next disclaimer. Uh, well, this is an interesting talk because uh, it's... It's not really a talk about scheme at all. You know, so some of you, I think, have seen the 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 you know the solving the halting problem and, and you know curing cancer talk. That's not this talk. This talk is basically all medicine. There's going to be a little shout out for where I think scheme has a role to play, but a lot of shout outs for where uh, computation has a role to play in, in in precision medicine. And a lot of it could be PF, uh, not 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 just scheme. So this this is really sort of you know, you know why am I leaving scheme and what are the opportunities on the other side of the fence if you want to run over to to medicine. Uh, so, but of course, you know, you know, anything can be turned into scheme if you just put S expressions around it. So now, <laughs> now it's a scheme talk. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> so, what what is precision medicine anyway? Well, uh, I think my old boss defined it best when he launched this initiative two and a half years ago, and he said that precision medicine is a new way of doing medicine. It's not a it's not a kind of medicine. It's not like you know heart heart medicine or or, or um, you know cancer or something like that. It's it's really about how we do medicine. It's really about making data, medicine data driven. And the piece of data that everyone is excited about in precision medicine is the genome. Uh, but I mean, EHRs count too. I mean, EHRs are a rich source of data. And there's other ohms coming down the road that will also be used in precision medicine. There's the transcriptome and the metabolome and the proteome. And all these things will be useful on our healthcare going forward. But right now, everyone's very excited about the genome, so it's very closely associated with this idea of precision medicine. And in precision medicine, the real goal here is to make sure that we always deliver the right drug to the right patient at the right time. That's the essence of precision medicine. And it may sometimes mean, if, if the right drug is not available yet, that you develop that drug. And that means that sometimes science itself becomes the medicine that you do in the context of precision medicine. So with that in mind, there's really three humble points I'm going to get across in this talk today. Uh, I want to tell you a story. It's a personal story of what happens when um, you're a computer scientist that's told that your child is the first and only case ever discovered of an ultra-rare genetic disorder. Uh, and I want to use that story to illustrate an execution through an algorithm, which I'll then expand on in, in general at the end, um, that I think provides a, a framework for how to go after genetic diseases in general, or diseases of the genome in general. And that includes things like cancer. Uh, and as I do this, I want to point to opportunities for computer scientists to engage with medicine. I, mean, I think this is a really rich time in history. In fact, what I keep saying to people in medicine is that I mean, we definitely need computer science in medicine. But what we really need in medicine are computer scientists. We need people who think like us going to the other side and applying our skills in the way we think to that thought process. Uh, so that's really what we need. Uh, so let's, let's look at the algorithm and an execution uh, of one path. So it always starts with uh, an input. And the idea here is to map you know, the, a patient basically to their data, often their genome or other, or other forms of data, to isolate what's causing disease for them in a very precise way, and then to turn this into the perfect medication. 
uh, so that absolutely corrects whatever it is uh, uh, their, their underlying condition is. So what we want to describe is a function that maps patients to pills. That's the idea here. And of course, we can't really build this function. It's, 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 I mean, it's beyond a computable. So what we're really going to build is an approximation that maps a patient to either a set of pills that might be in scope or a set of experiments to run that, if run, would illuminate what, what medications we might want to give to that patient or more experiments we would want to do down the line. And if you iterate this, you eventually end up with uh, the pills you would want to give to a patient. It's actually, it's not always pills. Sometimes uh, there's, there's, you know, in different therapies, it doesn't always have to be a pill, but you want to modulate the genome in some way, and it could be through exercise or, or potentially through a very careful diet in certain specific metabolic conditions. Uh, but in any case, this is the, the high-level idea. And the input to the algorithm in my case that got me on this journey was uh, my son Bertrand. And I want to be clear that even though Bertrand is very unique, uh, that this is a story being told you know, many thousands of times over. There are tens of thousands, there's about 10,000 different genetic disorders now that are all sort of ultra rare. Uh, so there's a lot of people going through this process. I'm helping a number of them through this process as well uh, through, my, through my new institute at UAB. Um, so even though this is a personal story, this is in, in, this, you know, just bear in mind that this, you know, the sort of the, what you're seeing is told many times over out there in the real world. Uh, but it begins for everybody on a place called Undiagnosed Island, where you, know, you, you have your child and you don't know what is wrong with them. And in our case, we didn't know why it was that Bertrand had developmental delay. We didn't know why Bertrand um, you know, couldn't cry tears. We didn't know why Bertrand uh, had you know, seizures. We didn't know why he had a movement disorder. Uh, but we knew he was suffering in some way. And so this, this, this was hard. But it was also motivating. I said, you know, I've, I've got to figure this out and uh, got to come up with a solution for, for him. And it took us 48 months to get to a, just, just a diagnosis. And the way we got to that was we did, um, we, we teamed up with a, set of, a team of scientists at Duke University. So I, I knew by this point, this is four years in, that we had to go into his genome to look for the cause of this disease. Uh, I learned enough genetics by then to know this was definitely a genetic disorder, and we had to examine the genome to figure out what was really wrong here. So this is the team that ultimately did it. And the thing that changed it and made it possible is we didn't look at the genome, we looked at the exome. The exome was the 1% the of your genome that encodes proteins. And it turns out this is probably responsible for anywhere to 80, 90 percent of all diseases of the genome, the protein coding portion. So it's a, it's, it was a fraction of the cost to sequence this region. It's still a fraction of the cost to sequence this region. And it's very effective in finding mutations that lead to disease. So did this. Uh, we looked into his genome, and what we found uh, after sequencing, or really into his exome, was that he had inherited two loss of function mutations in a gene called NGLY1 or NGLY1. Uh, and, and loss of function means he's basically missing this gene. He's, you know, he just doesn't have it, uh, or, or it's not completely non-functional. And then, we had some very weird answers back from the Duke team along with this. They said, he appears to be the first, and in fact, only case we have ever seen of this disease, of this gene ever being linked to human disease. No one has ever been seen with this disease before. Uh, so he's in many ways an N of one. And that was definitely a shock. You know, I think every parent wants to believe that their child is unique. Um, but there are degrees of uniqueness which are completely inappropriate. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that was a bit much. And then, of course, you know, there's the question of, well, I mean, we all carry thousands of mutations. So how do you know that NGLY1, this, this, you know, this gene in particular, was really responsible? And this is where you have to do some sort of genetics homework. So what we did was we took Bertrand's uh, phenotype, his, you know, basically his, 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 the, the, the accreted electronic medical records, and we looked for signs that this gene was really, dri really driving disease in this case. And to, uh, to do this, to do this, to do this work out this puzzle, you have to understand what the gene actually does. In this case, the gene NGLY1 is responsible for encoding an enzyme called N-glycanase. And N-glycanase is responsible for deglycosylating misfold de glycoproteins after they've been retrospectivated from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. Um, so obviously, uh, what this means is that well, okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the deal. Uh, you know, there, there, actually, there are, there are certain sentences you never expect to have to say as a parent, and I guarantee you that was one of them. Um, well, what, what's really going on here is Bertrand is missing a recycling enzyme. So these things called glycoproteins, sometimes they misfold, they have to decommission them, and a step in, re in recycling them is to pull a sugar off of them. Well, Bertrand can't pull the sugars off, and so these things just pile up in his cells. So if you take away this enzyme, you start seeing an accretion of these misfolded glycoproteins. So we said that, well, let's see if there's any evidence of that in his medical record. And I remember looking into his lab reports and, uh, on a liver biopsy, and there was actually evidence that this was actually going on in his liver. Uh, I turned to an expert at uh, in molecular biology, Dr. Fries at Sanford Burnham, who I've been collaborating with now for five years, and said, you know, do you really think that, given all this data, this really is the cause of the disease? And he said, well, I think almost certainly this is what's causing the disease in your son. I think this is, I think you've actually got it here. 
And at this point, I, I think there's a, an opportunity that, that I have to call out, which is that we're really bad at figuring out what mutations do to people. You know, and I think that you know there's there's a real opportunity for building, particularly in the machine learning side of the fence, uh, classifiers that say this is pathogenic, this is not pathogenic. When it comes to particular mutations, I mean, they're right now people are doing stuff like this, and they're even getting used in the clinic, but they are terrible. They do a terrible job of predicting whether or not a mutation is really causing disease. And I feel like there's a real opportunity for computation to be to be brought to bear on this particular problem. And in fact, this this is something I'm I'm actively pursuing now. Uh, but there's there's plenty left to do. And of course, you know, it's not like this happens. Um, they also say things like, well, it's, it's not actionable. There's nothing you can do in a situation like this. because We can't even do a prognosis because there's nobody else out there that even has this disease. But the thing is, if you, you know, when just getting a name for this disease put us, put us from dozens of potential targets down to just one overnight. Yeah, and all those targets, by the way, were wrong. We were considering dozens of different diseases for Bertrand, but only one actually turned out to be correct, of course. And of course, no one knew what that was because it's never been published before. And the thing is, if you if you give a parent a target to shoot at, then they will just go start collecting arrows. And that's that's really what I did at that point. I said, I'm going to go collect arrows, and I'm going to go after this thing. Um, and, and this is where I think, because there's no medication you could take at this point, science is what becomes action in the event of the inactionable. And science, in this case, becomes the kind of medicine that you have when there's no medicine to take. So I said, well, let's, let's do science. Um, and of course, to do science, you need to stand on the shoulders of giants. And uh, the only problem with that in this case was that if you looked into something like PubMed, for how many giants there were, there were a whopping five papers on NY1. So we knew basically nothing about this gene. Uh, I mean, we knew roughly what it did, uh, but we had a lot left to learn. I think if you do the search now, they're somewhere on the order of 20. This is five years after the diagnosis. So we've learned a lot about this gene in a very short amount of time, thanks to, to Bertrand and some other patients I'll tell you about in just a moment. Uh, so I said, for now, we're going to need more giants. Uh, and, and so that's what we do. So I said, we have to go find more giants. And uh, I turned to Dr. Hudson Fries, the guy who I was working with uh, to determine pathogenicity. I said, well, you're a glycobiologist. You're the closest thing there is in the world to an expert on this disease. Can you tell me um, where we have to go with this? And so what, what Dr. Fries really did is he took me to the peak of Bertrand's diagnostic journey. He said, you know, this is how far you have come in terms of understanding this disease and what he's got. And this is how far you have to go if what you want to reach is understanding treatment and cure. And I realized that as difficult as those four years to diagnosis had been, it was substantially more difficult still to go all the way to a treatment. Um, but as, you know, as, as a parent, in a situation like this, you don't really think about what you have to do you, or how far you have to go. You just think, can I take another step? And if you can take another step, you take it and you do that day after day after day. Um, and now I'm going to show you what happens if you apply that process over the course of five years. So I knew there's no way to do this alone. Uh, this, this is, you know, no one can solve these, these all by themselves. I said, we have to have a community behind this. And I, I knew I could find others out there that had it. And I knew this because I looked into uh, databases that um, contained the, the, the distribution of different mutations in the human genome. And so you can see, well, if, if this is how prevalent this particular mutation is, then there ought to be this many people out there with the disease. They just don't know what they have. And so I estimated that it's a one in millions kind of disease, so it's very rare. Uh, but there's about 500 living patients out there somewhere in the world that should have this particular disease. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to go find them. And to find them, I wrote a blog post. And the blog post had to do two things. It had to go viral. And it needed to rank very highly in Google search results. So it's basically search engine optimization. That's what this blog post was designed to do. And uh, this is the blog post I wrote. And so there's uh, you know, 5,000 words down below for the search engine optimization portion. But the picture of Liam Neeson, that's for the make, making it go viral. And the, the thing is, it actually worked. It actually did go viral. Uh, although I think I probably could have put a, like a cat picture there, because the internet is like, sadly predictable on this stuff. Um, but yeah, it actually it did go viral. It was seen by millions of people in a very short amount of time. Uh, it did start ranking very highly in Google search results for all the right search terms. So basically, I, I wanted it to be that if some other patient or parent was out there typing these things, these, uh, their symptoms in, like I was for Bertrand for many years, they would land on this page and they would contact us. That's what I wanted to have happen. And uh, sure enough, it did. So within two weeks, for a brand new disease that even, know, even I didn't know about two weeks prior, uh, we connected with uh, two patients in Turkey. Two patients in Turkey who didn't know what disease they had and now suddenly did with a confirmed genotype. Um, and over the past five years, patients have been popping up all over the world. And what this has done is it has transformed um, my life and really this, this, this patient community. I would say from you know, uh, the, the darkness of that, that undiagnosed island and the darkness of uncertainty and replaced it with the sunshine and sunlight of science and community. And we're now a community that's very united in understanding, treating, and curing this disease. So as of now, I think we have uh, 58. Well, actually, it's 59 patients as of like two weeks ago. 
that are all in contact with each other and working towards understanding, treating, and curing this disease. So now you can ask, well, what can you do with an N of 58 that you couldn't do with an N of 1? It turns out there's an awful lot you can do now that you have a community. So one of the first steps for us was to put together a natural history study. We partnered with the NIH and said, let's study this disease. Let's figure out what it's doing in all these patients. So they had, they had this protocol set up, um, and it's for disorders of glycosylation. This is a deglycosylation disorder, but I argued to the program officer, really, you should let the, these patients in. And he said, you know what, fine, I'll let them in. And as soon as he said that, we became over 80% of, of the protocol by volume. Um, and we just put every living patient into this protocol at NIH and said, figure out what's happening in these patients. To give you a sense of what it's like to go through this, uh, I've got a picture here for every post-prod procedure or appointment that occurs during the course of a week-long admission at NIH. And every patient has agreed to do this every year for one week for the rest of their life. Uh, it's an awful process, but everyone's agreed to do this because they understand the value of the data that's coming out the other side of this pipeline. And uh, if, you, if you put together all the data from all the patients and, 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 and put it together and analyze it, what we're finding are very clear biomarkers, biochemical markers of this disease in patients. Biomarkers that we can use with the FDA to argue for drug approvals. And also biomarkers that we can use for diagnosis. So we found you know, unique oligosaccharides that occur in the urine of these patients so that you don't have to genome sequence them anymore to diagnose them. We can diagnose them from urine. And patients are now being diagnosed through urine instead of genome sequencing, uh, which is much easier to do and much more readily available than things like, like sequencing, particularly in, in, uh, in other parts of the world. So this has been a very valuable thing to do. And then the question is, okay, well, how do you take all this understanding about a disease and move towards a treatment? How do you treat a disease like this? And, or how do you treat a disease in general? And, and the high-level answer, I would say, is that you want to screen drugs. You want to test as many possible drugs or molecules as you can to see if they have activity against uh, this particular patient or this particular disease. So the way this works is you take the patient, um, you figure out what's going on with them genetically, so, and then you, you, build this, you build a model of it. It could be a fly model, a cell model, or some kind of model of the disease, but you get a model of the disease. You grow up the model of the disease and you, and you get a phenotype for it. And the phenotype is basically a measurement of the happiness or unhappiness with respect to the disease state of these particular cells. And so you know, they all start off unhappy because they're, they're diseased. And what you're looking for is a way to make them happy, some drug that, that pushes them in the opposite direction. And uh, so the, literally this is sort of state of the art. You just take every drug you can find. Uh, so you can do up to two million small molecules at a, at a time in some of these screens. And there's only a couple thousand approved drugs, but you can screen millions of molecules against cells to see if any of them make a difference uh, for a disease state. And this is literally what drug companies do. That's cutting edge drug development. Um, but actually it works remarkably well. And if you find something that actually does make the cells happy, you say, well, maybe this thing that made the cell happy well, can someday make the patient happy too. That's, that's basically drug development 101. So uh, the first step in that process is to create these assays to measure the mechanism of disease. And I got very lucky that at the time this disease was being discovered, uh, an assay directly measuring its mechanism was coming out. And so I can use this assay to screen for any comments that might restore the missing D-glycosylation activity in Bertrand. In fact, two weeks ago, I actually signed a contract with NCATS and a drug company to start doing this exact screen. Um, so we'll, uh, and NCATS is an NIH institute that does this sort of stuff. So we'll finally be actually be doing this sort of high throughput screen for, for Bertrand specifically. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's some of these robots like this. So these robots actually are the ones that will screen over the course of two weeks several million molecules at a time. Uh, so there's, again, there's another opportunity here, which is to create computational assays. And right now, when you make an assay, it's like a PhD level effort. You know, somebody sitting at a bench, studying cells, looking for how it's, it's, uh, it's got some mechanism over the course of many years. It's not easy to do. But there's companies out there like Recursion, which are using computer vision and high resolution microscopy and machine learning to compute phenotypes for cells just based on their images. And this works remarkably well. For about, so basically, if you take a gene at random and just knock it out, um, you get, a, you get, you get a, a morphological phenotype about 20% of the time that you can see under a microscope. And they can computationalize that so that you get this for free, essentially. So for about 20% of the diseases we encounter now, we know we can just use this approach to get an assay. We don't know which ones in advance it'll be, but there's you know, a reasonable chance that we, we can use this approach almost out of the gate for, for a lot of diseases. And of course, we're getting better over time looking at more subtle features of cells. So I think we'll get better resolution with this uh, as well. And you also want to create disease models. Uh, and thanks to technologies like CRISPR for gene editing, uh, for NGLI-1, we actually have already, in fact, had it almost very quickly. We have mice, we have flies, we have zebrafish, we have worms, and we even have yeast. Now, I don't know if the NGLI-1 yeast have the same nutty, wonderful flavor that, as the ones depicted here, um, but we have yeast nonetheless. Actually, yeast are the most frustrating disease, or most, most frustrating organ to use for this disease because they don't have much of a phenotype. They don't seem to be afflicted by the loss of this gene much at all. 
Um, but in any case, we, we have all these models to play with, and they've told us a lot about the disease. Uh, and then some people have said, well, if you know what's missing, if you know the enzyme that's gone, can't you just put the enzyme back in? Well, of course you can. Well, I mean, you can think about this in theory. Uh, can you, you can just synthesize large quantities of enzyme one and put it back into cells like a drug. Uh, well, except that, you know, if you, want, if you just buy synthetic human enzyme one on the internet, which is actually a thing you can do, um, it's $402 for 10 micrograms. Uh, which if you extrapolate out to therapeutic quantities, like enough to replace all the by one in an adult human body, is two million dollars a week. Um, and it's definitely not covered under Obamacare. Uh, so <laughs> but even that wouldn't be terribly useful. Uh, because if you just injected this right in as, as if it were a drug, it would end up in a part of the cell called the lysosome. It would get digested and turn into essentially a really expensive turkey dinner. Um, it would just be decomposed into amino acids. So that's, that's not particularly practical. But what you can do is you can modify the enzyme into a drug. What you can do is you can attach these things called polyethylene glycol anchors to it, and that makes it, that improves your renal clearance so you don't pee it out right away. And you can tip these polyethylene glycol anchors with a tap peptide harvested from HIV, that, and that's, this is the part of the HIV that makes it cell penetrant. So you take that part off of HIV, you attach it to these pegs, and now what you have is a cell penetrant enzyme that ends up in the right part of the cell. So you can engineer an enzyme into a drug uh, if you have enough time, energy, and patience. And someday, we're, we're working on this approach, we're not, we're not there yet, we can produce enough therapeutic quantities to actually be viable for the patients. And there are other diseases where this actually works. But there's easier stuff you can do still. You can consider metabolic diets. And this is where a little bit of scheme actually does get involved. Um, so enzymes are things that turn A's into B's. And if you are missing an enzyme, then logic says, well, maybe what's going on in this particular disease is you've got too much A or not quite enough B. So the strategy becomes, can you design a diet that uh, gives B or precursors to B or restricts A or precursors to A to treat the disease? There's a number of diseases where this actually works and works very well. So one example is PKU. If you restrict phenylalanine in PKU, it goes from a devastating disorder to basically cured. Uh, there's, you know, you're basically symptomless at that point. Or if you, uh, there's a number called MPI-CDG where if you just give them mannose-6-phosphate, again, devastating, effectively cured, just on this logic alone. And there's, there's, there's you know, dozens of other diseases that follow this logic too. Well, anyway, when it's, it's an enzyme. It's, it's a different kind, it's a catabolic enzyme as opposed to an uh, anabolic enzyme. But this logic still applies here. You can reason about metabolites that might be in abundance or in deficit. Um, and, you know, through you know, investments in basic science in this disease, we actually had a really good understanding of what those metabolites might be. So the, you know, the picture of you know, what was going on in the cells of these patients has evolved significantly over time. And so we have a very clear picture of the form of the aggregates appearing in Bertrand's cells, and, uh, and also a possible sequestration of one particular metabolite in these aggregates. So I predicted about three years ago now that there would be a deficiency of the, meta of the metabolite which is depicted by the little blue square on the screen right here. And that little blue square happens to be n glucosamine. Uh, it's a rare sugar, but, it's, you know, it's, uh, but it turns out you can, if, you just go if you Google it, you can buy it on Amazon. So it's not, it's not that rare. And uh, so I said, I think Bertrand is short in this particular compound. I think all the patients are short in this particular compound because I think it's being sequestered by this, aggreg this aggregation process. So I said, well, I'm going to buy a bottle of it. I'm going to see what this stuff does. So I, I took a bottle of it myself first, uh, and I didn't die. So I consider that effectively FDA phase one safety testing. Uh, <laughs> uh, because in my household, I am the FDA. Uh, just that required to remind you, I'm not actually the FDA. And then it was like a Star Trek level moral dilemma. I said, well, what do you do now at this point? Uh, do you give it to the kid? Because, well, what if, it does, what if it makes it worse? And I could, I could dream of reasons about how that could happen. I, I thought maybe it could dry the aggregation up. Uh, uh, but you know, Bertrand gave us the perfect opportunity because he ended up in the hospital, he got very, very sick, I came very close to dying, and I thought, if I had this bottle sick on, on my shelf, and I never gave it to Bertrand, and, and he died in the hospital, I just I could never forgive myself. So I said, as soon as he's out of the hospital, as soon as he's feeling better, I'm going to give him this bottle, and we're, I'm going to see what happens to him. And about three days after he was on this compound, um, in a disorder where no child had ever cried a tear before, he cried the first tear of his life. Uh, I've cried many tears since. So, um, and uh, I did what any parent would do in the situation when they see their child cry for the first time. I collect this tear, pack it on dry, and ship it to a lab in California for analysis. Um, <laughs> because it turns out you can look at tear proteomes. There's a tear, and the proteome differs based on whether it's a, a pain cry or an emotion cry. Uh, and so you can do this sort of stuff. And you know, the other patients cried many tears since then, but it's, it's been really a big opportunity for us in the science of this disease. So it was one small tear for Bertrand, but again, an ocean of science for Engli-1. 
And, if, and, and now here's the thing. All you're thinking, oh, that's, that's wonderful. But if this were a room for a biologist, the next question would be, you know, it's great, man, that you find that works in people. But what we want to know is, does this work in flies? Um, <laughs> you know, and, and so literally, every time I give this talk to a room for a biologist, all, they're like, you know, and guess what? I, I wonder if it works in worms. Like, it's like, no, it's just... Great, but anyway, <laughs> works in people, and that's what matters. Uh, and uh, but actually, so I, I teamed up with Clement. We actually uh, we actually did figure out the answer to this question. So if you give flies the same disease as Bertrand, they have a devastating survival rate, like 17 percent. So it's bad. Yeah, this this is a devastating disorder for flies too. But if you raise them on this rare sugar and keep them on this diet throughout their lives, their survival rate goes to around 80 to 90 percent. So works in people, works in flies, and we have a lot of evidence from the flies about exactly what's going on probably in the people as well. So flies are actually wonderful for study, because you can do things with flies you just could never do with people. Um, but in general, what if you want to scale this, this sort of methodology up to every metabolic disorder in the world? Well, this is where the scheme might actually come in. Well, there, there are ways of representing um, these you know, metabolic pathways as sets of effectively rewrite rules. And you can encode these in languages that biologists are building, like Kappa. Uh, and and this, this is where it gets really important to do this right. Uh, so right now, you know, uh, you know, you, you can code these in Kappa, and you can basically take out one of the rewrite rules that simulates the effect of the enzyme going awry, and then you can do can, can have the simulation to say, well, what happens in the absence of this rewrite? What happens in the absence of, of this enzyme? And you can predict which metabolites have gone up and which ones have gone down, at least in a, in a very principled way. Um, except that, you know, I, I think there, there's a real opportunity here because it's, the simulations are very difficult to do in a scalable way, so there's definitely computer science to do here. Uh, but also from a language design perspective, Kappa is awful. Uh, but Kappa is winning. So we need to go replace Kappa now uh, with proper PL design principles. Uh, and so I, I think it'd be wonderful if there was a DSL and scheme that essentially replaced Kappa. That would be fantastic. And uh, I'd really like to see this be the foundation for, for good work in systems biology. Uh, and the clock is ticking, you know, because Kappa is gaining strength. I and mean, if, if it gains traction, it'd be like the C of systems biology. And we just can't let that happen. Uh, so anyway. Yeah, and then you know, I, I, I said, okay, well, it's, it's good that I give Bertrand tears, and it also had an effect on his nighttime seizures, but I wanted to go further. You know, now that I got this disorder to, you know, made a dent in it, I wanted to go as far as I possibly could. And this is when I really started shifting most of my intellectual energy from computer science into biology and medicine. So what I did is I got a grant uh, to do drug development for this disease, like real honest to goodness drug development. And we started off, in this case, with planarian worms. So planarian worms are a wonderful model of developmental disorders because if you cut a planarian worm in half, what you get is two planarian worms. They're fully regenerative. Uh, so they're amazing little creatures. And even better, if you give them NGLI1 deficiency and then you cut them in half, what you get is a worm that's been cut in half. Uh, so that's great. And then what you can do is start systematically knocking out other genes in the genome of this worm to see if anything makes a difference in this phenotype. And so we did this. And we found out then that if you knock out this other gene called N-gaze, which is actually predicted by some other uh, you know, basic science experiments, uh, particularly cut by Tadashi Suzuki in Japan, that uh, when you cut this worm in half, even though it's missing two genes now, it does regrow. So this is, this is a good finding. What this means is that that second gene is now a target for an inhibitor. So we started developing, we started screening for inhibitors that could inhibit this particular secondary gene. Uh, with the idea being that it could restore some of the developmental aspects of this disease if we actually found it. So, uh, to find this inhibitor, I had to go from biology medicine back towards computer science. And uh, to do this, uh, we said, okay, well, N-gaze is the target. So let's build a model of N-gaze. And to do this, we took a bacterial version of N-gaze, or a crystal structure for the bacterial version, and then tweaked it using a process called homology modeling into the human form of this protein. Because no one had actually done a crystal structure for the human form. Crystal structures are expensive to do, but you can, you can tweak you know, a nearby protein from another species into a human protein with some, with some creativity. And then what we started to do is we started to look for any molecule that was inverse in shape and charge to the catalytic domain on this protein. Basically, the part of the protein that was actually doing the work uh, we wanted to find molecules that, that would fit in that pocket and, and hopefully stick to it and shut it down. That's what we were looking for. So, um, and again, this just if they fit in that pocket, there's a chance, we know they're at least an interactor or a likely interactor with this particular target, uh, and there's a chance they might even turn it off. Some will actually make it more active, uh, but some will actually cut, shut it down. So you're not so. shutting down, you're not switching off, the, you're not removing the gene itself. Exactly. So you're, you're suppressing the proteins that it produces. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. So we're, we're attacking the protein and saying, so the protein gets produced and then these things glue onto it and shut it okay. so that it's ineffective at that point. It's, it's, a, it's almost as if it weren't there. It's not going to be able to perform its original function. In fact, many of the drugs we take are basically inhibitors of one kind or another. They're shutting down some enzyme or some receptor of some kind so that it's no longer performing its function. 
uh, probably maybe about half of all drugs we take, period, are inhibitors of some kind. Um, and uh, we screened 200,000 different compounds using, using this approach. And again, all computationally, 70 compounds survived this. Um, and they looked like they were potential interactors. 14 of them were already FDA approved. So of course we took this set of 14, we took this to the lab, and we used mass spectrometry to check, do these actually inhibit this enzyme? And it turns out one actually does. And that one is Prevacid. So Prevacid you can buy at Costco. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I actually wrote a paper on this, and as I've been saying, you know, I, you know, even, you, know you can take all the popple and ICP papers and paleo papers I ever wrote, and put them aside because this is now, I think, the, the best paper I have ever written, or at least the one I'll be the most proud of, because this is the one that describes an actual treatment for my son. Um, and uh, the, the question is, well, does it work for Bertrand? And so I found this about a year ago. I put him on it about three months after that, and the amazing thing is it does work. You know, so uh, just as it, in, in, the, in the model organisms we use this on, it appears to reverse some of the developmental aspects of the disease, and it looks like it's doing the same in Bertrand. So Bertrand's never spoken a word in his life, but he's now started to use you know, assistive communication technology over the past month or so, actually, and speak to us and convey intent, which he had never been able to do before. You know, he could, he could communicate emotional content, but now he can communicate intent about what he wants to do as a human being. Uh, and he could never do this before privacy. So there's, there's a huge opportunity here as well, uh, and that's you know, to do much better at these docking simulations where we fit uh, these small molecules to these protein targets. Uh, I think you know, it'd be nice if you know, we, we could do these simulations on home computers instead of the clusters it currently takes to do. So there's, there's a lot of good work to be done here. And there's even companies out there that are you know, selling you know, deep learning versions of docking simulation, which appear to be significantly more accurate than a lot of the stuff that's been developed to, uh, to date. So, um, it turns out that Prevacid is not a full inhibitor of this target at safe quantities. So it's, even though it's, it's helping now, we know we can get much better still. So we're doing a process called medicinal chemistry. And medicinal chemistry is tweaking a molecule for its toxicity, its potency, and its bioavailability. And uh, actually, this drug company has signed up to, to do it for us. So Retrofin said, you know, you've de-risked the science enough that we will take this all the way into a sort of a super Prevacid and make it uh, as powerful as it possibly can be for these patients. And this is, you know, just five years after being told, you know, in a lab at Duke that no drug company will ever care about this disease, and yet they have picked this up and will probably take it all the way to market. Uh, so what this process looks like is you take this core structure and you build variations on it, uh, lots of variations. You start testing these to see if any of these have any activity uh, relative to the original molecule uh, in, in the patient. The problem with this, of course, is once you get a new molecule, it's a new drug. It's going to go all the way back through safety testing, all the way back through uh, clinical trials, all the way back through market approval. And that's, that's a difficult process. Um, but I, th I think there's a big opportunity here to do deep learning for things like toxicity, because toxicity is one of the biggest problems I think we're going to face in developing these ultra-tailored treatments for patients. Because in many cases, we're going to come up with lots of predictions about molecules that can help a patient. And the big question is going to be, is this going to hurt the patient? Um, and right now, the way we do that is we basically just give a, a ton of it to a mouse until the mouse dies. Um, and that's our rough guess at preclinical toxicity. I'm pretty sure we could do better than that. I think we could use our, our reactomics model, where we could look at all the crystal structures we know about to see if a particular compound will interact with them, or you know, deep, do deep learning. Because right now, if you talk to medicinal chemists, they sort of have this intuition about what's toxic and what's not. And they're pretty good at saying, well, I think this would be toxic because of this, 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 or that. I think we could, we could learn this. I think there's an opportunity for computation to help here as well. Uh, and then, of course, there's clinical trials. And clinical trials suck, because you know, as hard as diagnosis was, as difficult as treatment was after that, Actually, getting things approved is significantly more difficult still, um, because you know policy is way harder than science. So, uh, uh, yeah, to this point, I say that you, know, you sort of need all the cheat codes you can get. Uh, so, to, to build up cheat codes, I went and you know, testified uh, to Congress and uh, to the Senate, saying we need to change the policy because the science is running ahead. So, the, the science is running way ahead of the policy at this point. We have to change policy in this case. Um, <clears throat> And uh, you know, I've had some success, at least you know, on, a, on a state level in some cases, uh, and even um, hopefully soon nationally, about you know, getting some changes into law that will enable us to make it easier to get these medications to patients. People always ask, you know, how is Bertrand? And I, I say, like, he's actually doing quite well. He's a very happy kid. You know, he had hundreds of seizures per day when he was born, and now he has zero. Um, you know, we're starting to see some of the, the effects of the development of the lay reverse. You know, so he's communicating for the first time in a real meaningful way. Uh, but I think the bottom line here is that he's, he's happy all day long. And as a parent, that's what really matters uh, if you did to, to make your child happy. So I feel no matter what comes after this, it's all great because we've already succeeded in the, in the original mission. So now that's, that's one patient. That's one execution algorithm that I purported to exist. And 
uh, I, I think we can scale this whole process up. So what I'll show you now is uh, how to go from an N of one to many Ns of one. How do we do this over and over and over again for other patients? And to do this, I think we have to sort of put the whole process on, on rails, really. And, and if, if we want to go from a patient to a drug again and again and again, we need a, really a process or an algorithm for doing this over and over. So I'm, I'm not going to show you all the details of it. Um, I have a 60-page draft blog post if you want to know more about it. Um, but uh, you know, what it does is it says, okay, well, what's your genome look like? Where's the mutation? Which one's pathogenic? Uh, okay, if it's pathogenic, is it gain of function? Is it loss of function? Is it change of function? Is it partial loss of function? These are the kinds of things that happen when you get these mutations. And what do we do with that? Um, and all the way through uh, to the other end when you get to a clinical trial, and then finally to a pill for the patient. Um, I've done this, I've been you know, working with other patients now enough to the point where I believe that we really can scale this process up. And, uh, you know, but yeah, I got very lucky. I mean, some very strange things happened um, to, to allow me to answer this question in a much more confident manner uh, than I otherwise would, would be able to. Because people always want to know, can you really do this again and again? Or was this, was, was this a one-off kind of thing? And um, you know, so about two and a half years ago, you know, I, got, I got called to the White House, and the president said, you know, I've seen what you've done for your son, and I want to know if you can do, help us do this for the rest of the country. And I said, of course, absolutely. Anything you ask, I will do whatever it is you want. Um, if you want me to stand on that chair, I will stand on that chair. Um, <laughs> precision medicine, I'll do precision medicine. So, you know, th that, that started one engagement, and, um, you know, this is shortly before the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative. He said, I'm building this initiative. I want you to help architect it. I want you to help lay the foundation for what we're going to do with this new kind of medicine. And so I, I, I said, yes, of course, and, and that's what I've been doing now for the past two and a half years. Um, and then, uh, you know, it was, let's see, about a year after, about a year after laying sort of the, the foundation for the Precision Medicine Initiative, I shifted gears back towards the clinic. Because the Precision Medicine Initiative is really all about solving the data science problems around doing precision medicine. It's collecting lots of genomes together so that we can use data science to predict what's going on with a particular mutation. Um, I said, I want to move it back towards the clinical. So I announced this new initiative um, at the White House with the president called PETMA, the Patient Powered Precision Medicine Alliance, and a pilot project to go with this. And the idea was, can we get a proof of concept for precision medicine? Uh, before the president leaves office. Can we cure five diseases in 12 months? That was, that was the idea behind this, this project. And so to do this, I, I pulled together a whole network of institutions that could execute the, the algorithm that I just showed you in, in very high speed earlier. This is, this is essentially the processor that we're using to, to execute the algorithm for, for precision medicine. And uh, we actually did it. So we took a patient all the way to a pill uh, for five diseases in 12 months. And you know, so to, you know, to answer the question, does it actually work? Well, yes, it does. And I won't go into any detail now, um, but these are the diseases where actually we, I did something about uh, that was SCNA. Uh, and four of these, I should say, are, are genetic epilepsies. And I picked them very specifically because I thought these were very screenable and that there was a very good chance that these novel genetic diseases could be quickly, um, or I could very quickly find treatments for these particular diseases. Uh, KCNT1, KCNQ2, KCNB1, and USB7. So this last one is one of ones that has, has a morphological phenotype where the cells look very different and you can use computer vision to screen for compounds that might, might make a difference. For the prior four, I use electrophysiology, just looking at what happens when you electrocute a cell, essentially, uh, to a particular ion channel. Uh, yeah, so the, to answer the question, can we really do this? The answer is yes, yes we can. And uh, yeah, I was actually able to go back before the president left, left, left office and give him my final briefing and say, yeah, we did this. We actually can. Uh, do precision medicine scalable in practice in the clinic today for patients right now. And we're going to be able to do a lot more in the future. So what's next? Uh, well, um, I'm sadly sort of leaving computer science. I mean, I'm actually got a paper tomorrow at ICFP still. And paper <laughs> so, so I haven't totally left yet, but uh, but you know, I, I just find this more and more of my, my, my intellectual energy moving into medicine. And, and you know, I got to say, uh, even though I'm still publishing papers on the medical side, there's nothing quite like helping a patient. Uh, it, is a, a, it is a feeling that there's really no substitute for. And so this, this is where I'm, I'm putting my efforts going forward. Uh, and I'm now the director of the Hugh Call Precision Medicine Institute at UAB. And what I'm doing is taking the algorithm and, and ex, you know, laying it across this entire you know, massive hospital system and academic infrastructure so that as patients come in, we can route them through just like I was doing for Bertrand. Um, and there's th three major focus areas for the institute uh, starting up. We're going to have rare diseases. So if you're undiagnosed or you have a known diagnosis for rare, disease, rare genetic disease, we can execute that algorithm for you today. And patients have already come in. I've been doing this for eight weeks now, and I'm already doing drug screens for new patients. Um, that came in with a gene identified. You know, I found the assay, we're moving to the high high, 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 high screen equipment, and we're going to find a drug that works, that works for their child. 
The next big focus is actually precision oncology. You know, because cancer is a disease of the genome. It's just that it's not one, one gene. So in, in, in rare disease, it's, it's usually just one gene that's affected. Well, with, with cancer, it's many genes that get affected. Usually it starts with uh, the loss of a tumor suppressor, and then you get lots of cascading mutations after that, eventually proliferating into the growth genes, which cause the cells to start rapidly dividing. Um, so with cancer, you have multiple targets to shoot at. What you really need to do in cancer is take the algorithm I showed you and run it in real time over and over again as cancer continues to evolve and mutate. Uh, but we're doing this. You know, we're, we're finding that you know, if we use targeted genomic information about individual tumors, we can find medications you never would have predicted you would use for, for certain kinds of cancers, including things like glioblastoma, which were effectively death sentences. I mean, no one survives glioblastoma. And yet, in some cases, we're finding targetable mutations in individual patients. So we can find medications that work for them to extend their life. And uh, the third big focus area is pharmacogenomics. And the first big thrust in the space that I've, I've decided to do is pharmacogenomics for depression and anxiety specifically. Uh, just because I think there's, there's a lot of people that are suffering from this. And we can use your genetics to predict with very high specificity whether or not you will respond to a particular antidepressant or have a very adverse reaction to it. So I think we can short circuit diagnostic and therapeutic odysseys and depression from years down to months, uh, which I think will have a huge impact on the quality of life for these patients. Where do we donate our blood? Were you doing it? I'll take it, uh, right after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I, I hope what I've done, ultimately through this talk, is, is really you know, uh, convince you of this phrase not actionable, which was told to us you know, five years ago when we were getting this terrible diagnosis, uh, that has absolutely outlived both its usefulness and its truthfulness, because even then, in fact, probably always, um, in the event that you were told that there's nothing you can do, you can always do science. So um, with that, thank you, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>
to build a static analyzer that will predict the absence or presence of particular metabolites. So I, I think there will come a time when we're using kappa and abstract interpretation to help human patients with both rare diseases and with cancer. We're not quite there yet. Simon. Look, any other debilitating, potentially curable diseases like motor neuron disease or uh, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, do these techniques apply to that too, to them too, as well? It does. In fact, uh, at UAB, I've got uh, an Alzheimer's sequencing project underway. And so we are sequencing every single Alzheimer's patient coming, coming into UAB right now. Sorry, every early onset Alzheimer's patient coming in. Because we know these people tend to have odd genotypes. And what we're looking for are targetable mutations. Mutations where we think we can, we can hit the mutation with a drug of some kind. And I think, and this, I've been doing this now for about four weeks, I think I may have found some. So, yeah, I think Alzheimer's may be one of those diseases where it's very difficult to come up with a cure for everybody. That works for everybody. But we may be able to, to in individual cases, identify very individualized treatments that really only work for them. You know, so I mean, the way you get Alzheimer's, I mean, there's several mechanisms involved here, is that your, your APP protein starts to break apart and retangle in, in certain specific ways. And so I think uh, one way you can look at doing this on an, on an individual, individualized basis is, you know, look at the, the predicted tangles that might form for a particular patient and check to see are there drugs that might insert themselves between the way the tangles form and block the formation for just that patient. That might be possible. And in fact, there are other related diseases, like prion diseases, where this approach might be reasonable to do. So the, I, I have you know, colleagues back in the Broad Institute, Eric and Sonia, where this is one of the approaches they're taking to a disease that, Eric, or that, that Sonia happens to have. She knows she, at some point in her 40s or 50s, she's going to go rapidly downhill with a, an Alzheimer's-like disease um, driven by prions, these self-aggregating proteins or self-replicating proteins. And so uh, I referred them to Atomwise to do these docking simulations to check to see, are, th are, are there small molecules that might fit between Sonia's versions of the PRP protein? protein so that they prevent aggregation for just her. Uh, and so I think for a lot of these diseases, we could take a very sort of ultra-individualized approach uh, in, in, in treating them. So yeah, I, I do think these approaches will apply uh, to these sorts of diseases. Yeah. So um, I can see from the talk that a lot of ideas from computer science inform your approach. So for example, an algorithm, one of the main, main things you got, you got away from this, aside from the specifics. Um, do you think that there are lessons in in medicine for computer science? So it just occurs to me that anything that could be subject to some kind of diagnostic treatment, so I think education, as a lot of people think about certain styles of education in a diagnostic way, like, oh, you don't know the chain rule or something like that, that's diagnostic. Um, can we, could we take even more general lessons or kind of reinforce sure. some of your skills from this, this talk? Yeah. Actually, as it turns out, you know, I gave a talk similar to this two years ago uh, at the White House, and there were people from different parts of the White House in attendance, including people from the education group. And after this, I said, well, what does precision education look like? You know, how do we take a student's individual learning profile, and all the data about them, to tailor learning specifically for them? Are they an auditory learner? Are they a visual learner? Uh, and so that, that got them thinking, you know, can we, can we use you know, data and computation to drive really individualized education? So yeah, this idea of like, you know, precision medicine is probably more general. I mean, I, I, honestly, it's, it's like, what, what happens if you apply computers to it? That's precision, you know, uh, precision anything, or it's what it seems to mean at this point. So I, I, I agree. I mean, I think any time we can take in, you know, individual information about a person, and apply computation, I think of course we can come up with something more targeted for, for that particular person. I mean, obviously Amazon's good at this. I mean, they come up with precision advertising. Um, <laughs> we just never called it that, but that's what it is. Yeah, yeah so the algorithm you proposed, um, you, you didn't really go into the details, but your, your proof was basically just, it worked, here are some test cases. Uh, it, which is fine given the circumstances. I'm curious if there's any like. No, I will not prove this in cock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I just wanted to know how how do you know this is the right one, or maybe there's a uh, second precision medicine algorithm that could be even more effective. Oh well, okay. So this this is a living algorithm, I should say. You know, so the, there's a, there's a blog post backing this that I you know, continuously update in light of my experience with new patients. You know, so the more I learn, the, the more update I, I update this algorithm to. Uh, to be able to handle different kinds of diseases. Although, I haven't had to update it a whole lot in the past year. Uh, it's, it's starting to hit, I would say, a fixed point. Um, and I, I think that it will at some point stabilize. And we'll, we'll have a, an algorithm that's roughly general enough for almost anything you can throw at it. Okay. And it, oh, well. So, so is there anything that people in this community 
might be able to contribute. If, if we want to help, I mean, I'm going to help you because I'm going to help. <laughs> but if, uh, if someone wanted to contribute, is there any is there any way that there's sort of like a junior developer website or something? You know, is there, is there any yeah. place that we can you know kind of get the community involved in or direction or is there like a popple mark for this? Or yeah, well, it's, it's well the popple mark or patients in this case. It's like you know, can we actually cure? Because I think there's a spectrum of disease, and some of some I, what I've already started. I'm actually, I'm, I'm calling it the human screenome project. I'm carving up the genome into regions of screenability to determine, you know, what's what's most screenable in terms of a drug screen and what's hard to screen. Um, and, and so I think that, yeah, yeah, there are, are there ways for this community to engage? Yeah, definitely. Um, a, a cap is the most obvious one, or systems biology in general. And yeah, well, yeah, the frustrating thing is that the bottleneck in that approach really isn't the PL. It's uh, it would certainly be made much more elegant if if we applied our techniques to that community. We probably make you know, much better compilers for them, they have faster simulations. Uh, and certainly simulation speed is a bottleneck, but it's getting the data into, uh, into the rules. You know, encoding those rules in the first place sometimes requires basic biology. Um, yeah, so, well actually, we, we talked about this at one point. If you, so, you having spent some time peering into wet labs, it's, it's unbelievable. You would never believe what they make their graduate students do. Like, you can get a PhD by just slicing brains all day. Um, this is ridiculous. Like you, PhD students should think. That's what we do in computer science. We think. I, I hope that's what we do as grad students in computer science. Um, but they slice. They slice and they pipette all day long, and they get a PhD for that, um, which is a little weird. And you know, if you look at what they're, it's very repetitive. And I think, why don't you automate this? Why are you sitting there slicing brains all day? <clears throat> why don't you just build a little machine to do that for you, or program the machine you, you have sitting idle over there to do that? Because oftentimes they have these machines sitting there, but. <clears throat> they just can't. They just don't know how to program them. If we had better DSLs for automating labs, <clears throat> that would be amazing. So, go sit in a wet lab for a week. You'll tear your hair out and say, "I want to automate everything in this lab." And it's not that hard. You know, I think you could start with 3D printers and build some pretty cool stuff and save an awful lot of grad student brains from the monotony of the labor that they do. Yep. Okay. So, uh, during this talk, you gave us a lot of great things that and potentials that this has. I want to know some of the limitations of individualized medicine you think there will be. You, so wh you where, like where will this not work? Um, yeah. So the, the hard case is, so I identify the easy case as rare diseases. Rare monogenic disease reports, just one gene never changes, that's your problem. Cancer is the next easiest thing because it's multiple genes, um, but still, still, still a handful. And it's also that there, there's great need. And the hard thing is actually common disease. You know, common diseases tend to be highly multigenic in nature, where there's not just one gene that's really driving it, but a collection of genes that, that drive the disorder. And so with these diseases, you gotta hit like eight, nine, 10, 20 targets to, to actually make a dent in it if you want to take this approach. So that, that's where it starts to break down. The more genes you have to go after for an individual patient, the harder it gets to do precision medicine. Um, but it, it, it doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means it's hard. And ultimately, it may still be the best way to do it. So even though it's hard, we just have to sort of you know, go by, sort of gene by gene all the way through the genome, um, looking for ways to modulate them. And uh, eventually, we'll have an, a, a large enough pharmacogenetic set that we can arbitrarily modify the human genome and say, well, we want to go up in this gene or down in this gene, and this is the drug that will do that for you. And so someday, the, is, is the, the diseases that require the interaction of 20 genes are common, mm -hmm. yeah. and the ones that only require one are rare, it should be exactly the other way around. Uh, what do you mean? The common ones should be easier? No, no, the, the, the uh, things that involve the interaction of 20 genes should be wildly rare. Oh, I see. No, no, no. See, so How could it be? Was the ones that only require one? Hey, they should be common. Right, so it's not the interactions that are required. It's that each gene individually in, 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 increments your predisposition to that particular disease. Mm -hmm. So if you have four or five of these you know, genes, you might be highly predisposed to diabetes now. Uh, whereas if you only have one, you have much less risk of getting diabetes. And so each gene independently contributes to your risk for the disease. So for diabetes, there could be you know, a few dozen risk genes. Now, most diabetics only have a handful of them. Uh, all of us probably have one or two as well, uh, or variants of these genes that are, that, are, that are driving the disease. But it's, it's, it's not enough to actually get diabetes until you have, until you have enough of them that actually add up. But then if you want to go after the disease, you know, for, for this patient, it's, it's these five genes. For this patient, it's these six genes. And you know, in, in aggregate, there might be a total set of you know, 40 genes you, you have to target uh, to go after diabetes for any individual patient. 
Yeah. Uh, I see an economic problem. Uh, obviously, all these things require a lot of resources, and so how do we identify where best to use our resources? For example, um, you say that th there are lots of uh, lab work that could be automated. How do I identify, hey, uh, this is where I should, uh, this is a problem that I should spend uh, automating, and maybe someone should pay me or someone else to do the automating this or automating that, or how do we, um, get the automation as part of the of the process of how the people who do the funding think and uh, also the right automation because yeah. they made the wrong thing. It's a great question. You go, how do we decide you know, where to go first with all this? I mean, I mean it's, it's, this, is, this is a constrained optimization problem, um, but the problem is you know, some of the constraints are human life uh, and the quality of life, and so it, it's, it's a very messy decision to make. And I can tell you how I'm, I'm answering this question. Um, I, I have two sets of answers. So uh, at the institute I've set up at UAB, if you have enough money to fund me to do the research, I'll do the research. But if you don't, if I have to use my own resources, I have to go out to, if I have to go out to NIH to, to pull in resources, I have to talk to donors to pull in resources, then I'm prioritizing diseases by screenability. So, and I've identified the ion channel driven diseases as probably the most screenable diseases that are out there. These include epilepsies, they include pain disorders, and they include heart arrhythmias. Um, it's very cheap to do these screens. And so uh, I'm just sort of picking them off opportunistically because they're cheap to screen for. Each one individually might only have a few dozen patients, but I don't care. Uh, I, I'm doing it because the science is the easiest and most settled in this case. And then I'll sort of move my way through the human genome by uh, ranked by screenability, essentially. I'll give you another example of, of screenable regions of the genome. You know, so there's some, there's some genes that are highly conserved in nature. Basically, every organism has some version of them. And what actually happens to be one? And um, you know, when that happens, that means you can almost certainly use something like yeast as a model organism. And yeast will often exhibit some sort of growth phenotype, which is very easy and very cheap to measure. And yeast, like, yeast are like crazy, stupid, easy to, to modify. So for less than $10,000, if you tell me that you've got a mutation in a highly conserved gene, I can go build a yeast version of the disease, I can measure its, its phenotype uh, in terms of growth, and I can probably do screen every approved drug in the world to see if it has an impact on the yeast version of that disease. So that's, that's not terribly expensive at that point. And so as long as you land in one of these genes, there's, some, there's something inexpensive we can do right away. And, and there, yeah, there's large regions of the genome which I would say are screenable for under $100,000 right now. Uh, now there's some regions which are just attractively expensive, but um, you know, if you walk in the door, there's a good chance I can tell you there's something you can do for not a whole lot of money. Yeah. So what's the sort of scale of the problem? You talk about having to do basic biology to sort of map these molecular pathways. You talk about having to go through the whole genome. You know, how many genes are you going to have to deal with? How many molecular pathways, and how long is that going to take? Great question. Yeah, so, you know, it, there's 20,000 genes roughly in the human genome. Um, I would say we're really confident about a few, about, for in terms of what, uh, about a few thousand of them do. So most of the genome is kind of dark right now. Uh, some of it's totally dark, where we have no idea what a particular gene does. Uh, now, how, so how long is it going to take us to sort of you know, map out the rest of the dark genome and, and, and bring it to light? This is probably a multi-decade effort. Um, although, it's happening faster and faster. You know, so nature is conducting what I'm, what I'm calling the human knockout project. Or if you look at all the human beings across the face of the Earth, for every single gene, there's at least one human being missing it. You know, so once we found Bertrand, we quadrupled our knowledge of NGLI1 uh, what this gene is doing in just four years. Whereas there have been 20, 20 years of study of this gene before that. So when the human model of, of a disease finally shows up, knowledge explodes, I mean, it, it accumulates very rapidly. Because you can, I mean, suddenly we're like, well, this is what this gene does in humans, because this is what happens when it's missing. So I, I'm optimistic that if we were to start to sort of canvas every rare disease patient in the world in a systematic fashion, we could complete this effort much, much faster. And there, there's some talk of actually doing this, like you know, going out and systematically sequencing essentially the entire rare disease population. Um, and if we were to do that, I think we could, you know, maybe in less than a decade, um, lighten up most of the dark genome and, and build out lots of these pathways very, very fast. This would be a, you know, a many billions of dollar effort. Um, but I think it's totally worth doing, because ultimately it benefits all of us. I'm not speaking for the administration when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> What are the challenges in terms of uh, uh, data in integration? Or I mean, is it easy to collect data and to you know, know what units is it in, or, or or is it updated, or is there some error? Is there some? Yo, yeah, so data collection. So right now the way people build these metabolic networks that they use for actually conducting things like simulations in Kappa 
is they, use, they apply NLP to abstracts from PubMed. Yeah. Um, and then they sort of manually curate it to make sure it looks okay. Uh, so are there problems in data collection? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, but that's kind of the best we can do right now. I mean, it'd, it'd be nice if every biologist were actually writing in a language like Kappa as they made their discovery. Actually, what would be great is if biologists included executable abstracts where they encoded their, their knowledge uh, from the abstract in a computational form as they publish it. Then we wouldn't have to parse it incorrectly and get it wrong, uh, which is what we do right now. It's actually, I didn't talk about this today, but our, the way I solved this problem for NY1 was like I started up a crowdsourced volunteer effort where thousands of volunteers were reading the abstracts uh, in a project called Mark to Cure. So if you go to marktocure.org, you yourself can sit down and start reading abstracts potentially related to NY1 and annotating parts of this abstract to say, you know, this is a gene, this is a disease, this is a treatment, so we can build up, up these pathways for not just NY1, but all disorders of glycosylation. So yeah, my way around it was, let's have volunteers do it. Um, and actually, it turns out, if you average six normal people, um, their, their, their aggregate accuracy becomes equivalent to a PhD in biology. So, I don't know if this is good or bad for PhDs in biology. But <laughs> what the mouse model <laughs> Six mice, one PhD, I don't know. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, good.